didn't know. Uh, so welcome to Carlton Gospel Hall's live stream. And tonight I want to read you a story uh, from the Gospel of Luke, it's chapter 19. And we want to take a look at an individual who met Jesus. You know, I'm really impressed with stories in the Bible that actually don't include miracles. I don't know about you, but when I read through the Bible, uh, I find it intriguing how few miracles there really are. Some people say that the Bible is a book that's just absolutely chock full of miracles. Just, and that's all it is. Just performances of, of amazing acts continuously, one after another in the miraculous. But you know what you discover in the Bible is that really there was only three times that miracles were performed. And we get miracles when Moses came along. We get miracles around the time of two prophets called Elijah and Elisha. And we have miracles around the time of Jesus. And those are separated by, by at least a thousand years between them. And so we really have in the Bible a record of the normal, not really a record of the abnormal, although it's included as well. And what impresses me about the Bible and when I, I read it and when I look at these things, I'm always impacted by individuals that really never had anything miraculous happen to them at all. You know, I, I know we can read through this book and we can find the miracles, and I'm sure it was very impressive uh, when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, and I'm sure it was impressive when, when 5,000 people were fed with a little bit of food. I, I know it was very impressive when some of these things happened. But when I read through, I'm always struck by the normalness of other individuals who never had anything miraculous happen to them, but they were fundamentally changed after they came in contact with Jesus. I don't believe that anyone can remain the same once you know and understand who Jesus is. I think there are individuals, I know there are individuals, and they have spent a considerable amount of time trying to debunk the Bible, trying to debunk Jesus, trying to, to, to throw out his ideas and throw him out personally and, and say that, well, he doesn't exist and, and we don't know anything about him and, and really there's nothing new to learn here. But every time individuals go and they read through the Bible to, to maybe to, to debunk Jesus or to do away with him and to try to disprove his words, what I find intriguing is that very often these same individuals who are trying to throw Jesus away ultimately come to dramatically different conclusions about him than what they had anticipated. I know personally individuals who went out to disprove Jesus and ended up being converted as a result of the process. And that's because this book is no ordinary book. The book that I'm holding in my hands, yes, it's English, yes, here we are in, in Delta, British Columbia, and we're, we're here 2,000 years later than when it was finally completed. But this book contains the Word of God. This book is the Word of God. It is God's message to all of humanity, and He has included it for us and preserved it for us so that we can find God, not just in the times of our deepest need, but in times of prosperity and in times of success, but also in times of sorrow. So let's read a story of a man who met Jesus, and I don't know what he anticipated or what he hoped to gain from the experience, but I do know he was changed as a result. And the change that happened to this man is the change that all of us need to have in our lives. Let's read Luke chapter 19. The Bible says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. Now a man named Zacchaeus was there. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to get a look at Jesus, but being a short man, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him because Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly because I must stay at your house today. So he came down quickly and welcomed Jesus joyfully. And when the people saw it, they all complained, he has gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, half of my possessions I now give to the poor. 
And if I have cheated anyone of anything, I am paying back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So there's a a number of things we can learn out of this story. And like I said at the beginning, this individual, he really had nothing spectacular happen to him. And yet what happened to him was profound in a deep, deep kind of way. It's the kind of change that every single human being on the planet needs to have happen to them. An individual who is living life, not seeing or finding what they are looking for, but then ultimately finding it in Jesus. And at the end of the story, we have a man who goes away and the Bible says he's full of joy. And that's really the essence, the essence of this story. A man meets Jesus and he leaves full of joy. So let's take a look at this this, this uh, story. So Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So if you were to visit the land of Israel, you would go to the West Bank and you would discover the city of Jericho. And it's about five or six miles north of the Dead Sea. And it's there uh, that Jesus met this individual. So Zacchaeus, the name of the man, he lived in this city of Jericho and he's there in the city, and there's a couple of things we wanna notice about this man and about this city. You see, when you're five or six miles from the city, uh, or from from the city of Jericho, you are actually five or six miles uh, uh, from the, the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea is just to the south of the city of Jericho. And the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the planet. If you were to look at an atlas or you go get a, a map Um, look it up on Google Maps, you'll discover that this Dead Sea is around 1,800 feet below sea level. It's It's a really, really low spot, below sea level. Now, right now, you can't quite see it, but in the background, we're on the Fraser River, and we're at about zero, zero feet above sea level. But here, in our story, Jericho is about 1,800 feet below sea level. In fact, Jericho is just about the lowest city on the planet. The lowest city on the planet. And in this lowest city, we are introduced to a man called Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus had a particular job. And you know what Zacchaeus' job was? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Now, in Canada, I don't really have a problem paying taxes because I I like hospitals and I like roads and I like law enforcement and I like all of the things that are there to keep our uh, society in health and in well-being. So I have no problem paying taxes. And when I pay taxes, I have a program and you can go down and you can list out all of the things that you have to pay. And sometimes we grumble, but you know, we still pay the tax, but at least we know what we're paying. And generally speaking, hopefully we know where it's going. But back in this time, when you were a tax collector, what it really means is that you were working for the enemy. Zacchaeus lived in Jericho and he was a tax collector, which meant that he was collecting taxes, sometimes unfairly. He was collecting taxes from all of his brothers in the, in the Jewish uh, nation, and he was giving those taxes away to Rome. And very often, the tax collector would be a little uh, a little bit shady and he would go and he would collect the tax and he would say well well here's the tax this is what you owe and the person would never be able to tell the truth if if that's what actually was owed and so that tax collector would take some money for Rome and then he would take some money for himself and that really was the way they operated so tax collectors used extortion tax collectors abused their privileges and their position And as a result, tax collectors were not very well-liked people. So we have an individual who lives in the lowest city on the planet, and he's got the lowest kind of employment that you could possibly imagine. Now there's something else about Zacchaeus. And it says here that he was small of stature. And when he was running to see Jesus, you know what he did? He had to climb a tree to see him. So this individual, because of the crowds, was unable to see over the heads of those who were in front of him. And so we have a real picture here, don't we? 
An individual living in the lowest city on the planet, engaged in the lowest kind of job on the planet, and he actually was the smallest person, the smallest person there. Talk about low. He's the lowest of the lowest of the lowest. But it says one thing about him. It said he was rich. He was rich. Now, I find it kind of intriguing that this individual who was rich, he still felt that he missed something. He still felt like, I don't have it all. I, I don't have it all. And you know, individuals who have tremendous amounts of wealth are going to tell you the same thing. That even though they have so much, there's always something more to gain. And the material riches of this world, they don't bring the satisfaction that you think they do. And you may think, even at this time when you might be unemployed, you might be ex experiencing some financial hardship, you might be experiencing all kinds of difficulties, you might think that money is the answer, but money is not the answer. And so this individual comes, and even though he has lots of cash, he still knows he's missing something, and he desires to see Jesus. So the Bible says he desired to see who Jesus was, but he could not because he was short. And so he runs ahead, and he climbs a tree, and there he is waiting to see Jesus. <clears throat> now, as he's climbed up this tree, we find a kind of interesting expression that's used here because it says that Jesus came to the place he came to the place and it says that Jesus saw him and I find it intriguing that the words that are used here are these when Jesus came to the place he looked up he looked up so we've got an individual who's the lowest of all humans in our story he works in the lowest kind of job, and he's working in the lowest city on the planet. And here he is, empty, even though he has all the material riches he could ever imagine. He is seeking Jesus to discover who he was because he wants him to answer some kind of need that is in his heart that I'm sure even Zacchaeus couldn't even express. And when Jesus came to the place, Jesus looked up. Now, I don't know about you, but if I look up, that means I'm the one who's lower still. And even though this man had all of these things working against him, and even though he was the lowest of the low and he realized it, and he realized that he needed something more, the Bible says that Jesus looked up. You see, this rescue mission that Jesus was on to save Zacchaeus Zacchaeus actually thought he was the one looking. It turns out that Jesus was the one looking. But when this rescue mission that Jesus was on came to pass, we discover this great truth that no matter how low you may think you are, Jesus Christ is lower still. There is hope. There is rescue. There is help. And it is found alone in Jesus. And when Jesus sees this individual, he looks up because he is lower still. And no matter how low you think you are, and no matter how desperate you feel, and no matter how sinful you might believe yourself to be, I can tell you with full confidence that Jesus Christ is the one who has come to seek and to save those who are lost. If you feel down, and if you feel burdened because of your sin, and if you feel guilt, and if you feel shame, I want to tell you that Jesus is the one you need. You don't need more money. You don't need a better job. Even if you tried to improve all of the relationships in your life, it still isn't going to meet your deepest need because your deepest need can only be met by having your sins and the burden and the weight of your guilt completely removed and forgiven so that you, are, you become a new person. This is what the Bible talks about. It, yes, it is miraculous, and in some ways it's not. It's not like Jesus is going to attach a new, uh, fix a broken bone, or he's not going to attach a new limb to somebody. He's not going to do some phenomenal act here. He's simply going to reach out to an individual who feels that they are the lowest of the low, and who knows that they desperately need something. 
And if that individual is you, I want you to know this. God loves you. And God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And when we come to this low person in the lowest job, on the lowest place of the planet, we discover that Jesus is lower still. And he looks up and he says to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. I am going to your house today. I find tremendous hope in that. You know, Zacchaeus was the one who was seeking Jesus. Zacchaeus was the one looking for Christ. Zacchaeus was the one looking for something more, hoping that maybe Jesus would be the thing. And in the end it was, but it turns out that Jesus is the one looking for Zacchaeus. I want you to know something, that if you are looking for Jesus, I can honestly tell you with full confidence, he is looking for you. Well, you say, how can I meet him? I, I can't go like Zacchaeus did, and I can't climb a tree, and I can't physically go to a spot and discover who he is and where he was. How am I supposed to meet Jesus? Well, I'll tell you where I met Jesus, and I'll tell you how I met Jesus. It was in a, in a school auditorium. And physically, I couldn't see him with my eyes. But through this book, I understood who he was, what he claimed to be. And I understood that when, when Jesus was crucified on a cross and he was punished there as if he was the sinner, he actually wasn't the sinner. He actually didn't do anything to die for. He didn't deserve any of the punishment that he got. And I realized that Jesus was the one dying for me. He took the consequence of, of my actions. He took the consequence of my sin. And there upon the cross, Christ died for my sins. Those are five words. Five words that you can understand and take with you the rest of your life. Christ died for my sins. And when I understood not only the historical fact that Christ died, but the great spiritual truth that Christ died for me, I believed, I believed Christ. I trusted him with everything that I had. And I told him that I believed him. And I told him I trusted him. So I can meet him. I can meet him because the scriptures, the Bible tells me who he is. And when I go to this book and I understand who he was, I can believe on him with all my heart and I can be saved. And then after that, I can pray to him and I can speak to him and I can tell him every detail of my life. And the Bible promises me that his ear is not too heavy or it's not filled up so that it can't take another prayer. We are dealing with the eternal God. And here is the way that we can meet him. We can believe him. We can trust him and we can find him in this book. You know what happened to Zacchaeus after he met Jesus? It says this. He received him joyfully. You know, I don't know what you're looking for in life, but I can guarantee you that joy is one of those things. You might be looking for it in all the wrong places. Maybe you've looked for it in all kinds of things. You might have looked for it in, in relationships. You might have looked for it in pleasure. You might have looked for it in money. You might have looked for it in some kind of success, maybe at work or, or in some nonprofits that you join. And maybe you're seeking to, to have this feeling of joy and fulfillment that you would like to have. Well, when I became a Christian, I can tell you this. It felt like a burden was lifted off my shoulders when I realized that all my sin and my guilt was gone. And Christ paid the debt that I had. And he took it all upon the cross when he died. And I was relieved from the consequence of my sin. And I was relieved from the burden of my sin. And I was saved. I was rescued because of my faith in Christ. And based on the fact that he died on the cross. And this book tells me that when an individual received Jesus, he does so with joy. With joy. And you can have that same joy. And you can have that peace through Christ because of everything that he did for you. You know, I'm just going to close with Zacchaeus's change. 
Zacchaeus changed his life. Jesus Christ changes lives. Some people say, well, I read the Bible and I said a prayer. And when I was younger, I, I said the magic words, but it never really did anything for me. And you know, I, I tried that and I'm not interested anymore. But here's the thing. Did you just read and then go along with words that somebody put in your mouth? Or was it like Zacchaeus? Recognition of a deep need inside, a hurry to go and find Jesus, a response to an invitation to receive Christ and to do it joyfully, and then, and then to live a life that proves it. And you know what Zacchaeus did? He told Jesus right on the spot. He said, half my goods I give to the poor, and if I have extorted money or used false information to get money out of anybody, I'll give him back four times as much. What was he doing? He was demonstrating the reality of a change that happened on the inside of his heart. You know, these people in this story, they accused Zacchaeus. They, they really denigrated him. They said, well, he's, he's, look at Jesus is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner and no one else around him liked it. And I would just tell you this, that if you were to receive Jesus Christ and believe him and follow him, don't expect anybody else around you to appreciate it. Don't expect to get the laurels lauded on you and don't expect to get any kind of great reward from society. That'll never happen. Believing Jesus and following him might cost you a lot. I know individuals who have followed Jesus Christ. It has cost them their families. It has cost them their jobs. It has cost them money. And some individuals that I have heard of worldwide, it even cost them their lives. This is what it means. But you know, it's better to follow Christ that way than to never meet him at all and to live a life wondering, did I miss it? Did I miss it? So I want to tell you this. The Son of Man, that is Jesus, he has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And if you have the emptiness in your heart and you are looking to fill it and you are seeking to find something to fill up that void, I want you to tell you this. I want to tell you this, that if you are seeking, Jesus is seeking you. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. You can be saved. You can be rescued from your sin because Christ died for my sins. Believe him. Trust him. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. So that's our story about Zacchaeus. If anything that I have said requires clarification or if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We want this message to go as, as wide as possible. We want people to understand that there is hope, there is safety, there is fulfillment, and there is peace and joy in Jesus Christ. And so if you do have questions, please let us know. We plan to be back here, Lord willing, next Sunday at 6 p.m. And we'll answer some more questions. And we'll deal with a, 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 a different group of subjects. And we'll talk about what the Bible says about a whole variety of things. But we'll be here, all being well. We want you to be here as well. But God bless you. The Lord keep you. And we pray that you would be saved to understand that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Thank you.